to a very rainy, wet and cold Boulder, Colorado. It is um, not the type of day you want to go outside with any electronic equipment. So we're going to do a fun show inside and it is the top 10 unusual and bizarre or bizarre and unusual pickup trucks. Uh, and we want you guys to participate in this yeah. because we want you to uh, you know, create a list of your own vehicles that you've thought of. Now, bear in mind, these are factory-built vehicles or vehicles that were built by the factory and then sent to a second party to modify, but they're still basically production trucks. Alrighty, um, and yeah. how are we doing on sound? Um, they, say, they say it works. Sound is working, yeah, guys? Fine. Okay, great. Sorry about that. We're ugh. Every time we think we've got it nipped in the bud, Sound so, goes away. Yeah, so we have different microphones we've used. <laughs> Probably we've tried like four different microphones, lapel mics, and but we're trying to figure this out. Of course, you know, this is early days, but it's streaming and it's live, and we want to engage with you guys. So let us know your comments and questions. I have pulled up the chat room here, so I will be able to, you know, we can talk about comments and questions. Which are right here, so they can actually see their own comments and questions. <laughs> And duplicate. <laughs> yes. So yes. can we can we remo remove that and actually show what's underneath it? Because what you're seeing underneath this is our number 10 truck. And these are, well, you tell me, guys. Just check this out. So this is our number 10 on the list. Yeah, this is the Toyota Dually Sun Raider. And no, it didn't come out of the Toyota factory like that. They actually sent it to a second party in California. And for four years, these trucks were being built. And they were primarily built either as this or they would use the platform and build motorhomes on them. And there are various motorhomes from Chinook and Dolphin that um, these, these trucks were based on. But this particular one, if you could scroll and show the... Uh, look at the side. That is the back seat. <laughs> That's like a limo back seat. Yeah. And in some cases, I've heard that they actually will pull out and turn into a couch on their own. Now, these were built to be tow vehicles, but they still had the 22R four-cylinder engine, which is a legendary engine for its uh, ability to last a long time and uh, general Not reliability. Very powerful. No, it? less than 100 horsepower. 97 horsepower, about 129 pound-feet of torque. And these are basically, we just wanted to count down top 10 bizarre trucks that you and I appreciate, yeah. but are so weird, right? Oh, yeah. A small dually truck, who would have thought you needed one? That would be really cool nowadays. Now, I've seen a few dualies kicking around. Once again, on the motorhome platform, they use a different rear axle and obviously a beefed up and stretched platform. Um, check this out, manual transmission. That was, I believe, they started with a four-speed and it was built over four years and it went to a five-speed later on. I drove a motorhome version of this for a little while and it was called a Dolphin and it had a five-speed manual transmission in it. And this is a motorhome that could sleep like six people. I, I kid you not. And it was really capable. How fast was it? Very slow. Extremely <laughs> slow. And this is in Los Angeles, which is near uh, sea level. And I still wouldn't get out of its own way. So up here in Colorado, oof, might be an issue. Let's move to number nine. Yes, Audrey? and number nine, we're switching gears completely. Quite literally. <laughs> and this is called the International MXT. It's basically a medium-duty semi-truck which was meant more as a consumer type vehicle. Right. And this was part of their XT lineup because they also had that, like the CXT. But this is basically, MXT in terms of international mm. uh, company speak was military extreme truck. And it is pretty extreme. It's extreme! <laughs> yeah, you can just see like the commercial with, you know, flames and stuff like that. Uh, this was, you know, one of the reasons why these trucks were built had to do with the whole community that really loved Hummers. And this is a much more capable tow vehicle yeah. that was built between 04 and 08. And uh, yeah, it was um, it was oversized and um, I've seen them on the road lumbering around. It is not exactly the fastest truck on the planet so either. In, uh, if I may, in my opinion, basically this truck, if you want to promote something, some people call it overcompensators, uh -huh. but... Um, but I've seen like Red Bull use this, you know, for promotional vehicles, yeah, with yeah. giant billboards and speakers and all kinds of stuff attached to these trucks. These trucks could actually tow. They have a diesel engine, mm -hmm. V8, and a five-speed Allison transmission. That's right. So they're sort of similar in their power to a, um, like a Chevy Silverado heavy duty. Right. But 
They can tow a lot and they have giant tires and then they looked awesome, right? Yeah. Now, I, I've never driven one of these. I've never driven one of these off-road, so I haven't done anything with them. But I have seen these vehicles being used by security companies and supposedly they're very capable and they're very powerful. So that's all I've got on it. But you don't see these on the roads very often. Uh, no, <laughs> you don't. Least. No. And they were about, you know, around $80,000 new, but people customized them. Oh, and like you crazy. Could take, you could take it over $100,000 very, very easily. Yeah. So they're not cheap trucks. And they hold their value. You know, if you look them up on eBay or something, Craigslist, right. you know, they're still not cheap. You know, people want a lot of money for these. Well, let's move on to number eight. Uh, number eight, Andre, if you could take us through it because the camera is blocking the board. No, I got it. It's the Mazda Rotary, uh, which was built where at least sold in the United States 74 to 77. Then the Mazda Rotary was a trippy little truck. I actually did get a chance to drive one because one of my buddies owned one. And that was in the 80s, so it was already, you know, 10 years old, 12 years old or whatever, and beat to hell. The thing about these trucks is that they had extremely small displacement twin rotor engines, but they put out 110 horsepower. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but compared to the other trucks at the time, it was a lot more power with a lot less weight. There were some problems. Uh, they ate oil, which is, well, frankly, kind of common for rotary vehicles, and it wasn't exactly what you'd call very torquey. However, they were a lot of fun to drive, and even though it looks like a Mazda truck, this is actually a completely different platform than the regular Mazda truck at the time, and also later on the Ford Courier. Ford never had the rotary engine in their couriers, and primarily it was because that was a completely different truck. So it was a fun truck to drive. They're very zippy, and now they're very collectible. I have seen these things going for crazy money, 20000 for a fully refurbished Yeah, truck. and this is a small, lightweight truck. Right? Yeah. So 110 horsepower, it's actually a fairly good amount of power for this truck. And I think now you guys are seeing you know, where we're going with this list. Yeah. Right? You know, these are kind of bizarre, quirky, kind of interesting trucks, very unusual. And this truck has a very unique engine. Actually, it's towing a uh, glider plane. <laughs> which, which makes a lot of sense. It's actually brilliant marketing. It really couldn't hold a lot. It couldn't tow a lot. But speed-wise, it was quick, so pulling a glider up off the ground uh, is, is a fairly good PR ploy. Uh, once again, I did drive one. Unfortunately, the cockpit is really small, and I'm not just talking about my big belly. I'm talking about back in the day when I was a little bit skinnier, I was too tall for it, so I had to sort of slouch down, and my knees were hitting the bottom of the steering wheel and whatnot. Not a very big cab, but a very fun truck to drive, and a great vehicle to restore if you're looking for a project. So... Interesting vehicle. So but, moving on to number seven. Yeah, now number seven is is actually a very big truck in terms of how small it is. <laughs> this was the only truck at the time introduced to, to the United States, that is, that had front-wheel drive and just front-wheel drive. This was called in other countries the Volkswagen Caddy. Here, I believe they just called it the Rabbit Pickup Truck. Yep, yep. And most of them came with a little diesel engine and naturally aspirated diesel. So not a lot of speed. And they had, you know, different, ver different versions of this truck. It was basically based on the MK1 first generation of the Golf platform. Right. And, you know, whatever the front end, the grill of the Golf you could get, you know, with square lights and later on with round lights. Right. You could also get a Caddy overseas or a Rabbit pickup truck with. And it came with actually two engine options. A 1.7 liter gas uh, fuel injected engine. Fuel injected. Fuel injected. And that was 78 horsepower. Almost 80. Yep. And it also had a little diesel, 1.6 yes. liter. That's right. And you still see those diesels running around today. Oh, yeah. A lot of people converted them to veggie uh, diesels, too. Yeah. They're, they're really popular for biodiesel. And they first came out in 79. So that's, you know, quite a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, they were. And, and, and this truck, despite everything, I've seen everybody from gardening services to moving companies use these little things and beat the crap out of them, and they just keep on going, especially with the diesel. It's real fun to watch those things going up and over the, uh, you know, like the Ike Gauntlet, because by the time they're at the top, they're going about 25 miles per hour, and that's and blowing black smoke. Blowing a ton of black smoke yeah. and everything else, and you see the guy inside, you know, holding, <laughs> white knuckling the steering wheel, just trying to get it up and over, but supposedly if you build them right and if you treat them right they will run forever and frankly i've seen a lot on the road so that could be true let's move on to the we're, next one we're and completely switching gears boy are uh, we <laughs> and this is, right. we're going a lot newer and a lot wackier and a lot more bizarre 
All right, I want to point something out. This, first of all, this is called the GMC XUV. It was um, built in 2004, and it had either a straight six or a V8 engine. They were that was optional. Now it may not look like a pickup truck, but see this uh, roof panel? It slid forward, and you could put tall items in here and also drop the tailgate and have, I believe, about a five and a half foot bed altogether. Yeah. So it had some interesting ideas. This is actually not a new idea either. There was a um, another vehicle back in the 60s that actually did this, a station wagon, um, a Rambler. But the point is, is that it was a really interesting idea, but the execution was really bad. I mean, well, really bad. So, I mean, GM really took a chance with this. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, they also had the Avalanche, and that was part of the problem. That yep. The Avalanche was also a convertible pickup truck where you could lower the uh, uh, mid-gate, basically, and extend the bed. To about 8 and feet. And you could do the same thing. You, uh, there's a little mid-gate here, which was hard plastic. You could fold it forward and put some longer items inside of this SUV, but it's also kind of a convertible transformer yep. pickup truck. Once again, a really interesting idea, but there were a lot of problems with it. And also, some people reported leaks from lots. this roof. There were lots of leaks. This is one of the first vehicles that I actually reviewed when I became a uh, professional journalist in terms of uh, automotive reviews. And one of the problems with a lot of plastic components underneath as well, a very long wheelbase, horrible breakover angle, so not exactly a 4x4 four four vehicle. Um, and if you were to go and like drive it up and over a hill or a rise, uh, water could go in these channels here and actually seep into the truck. It also had a swing gate in the back. Yeah. Not, not a drop-down gate, a swing gate. It didn't make a lot of sense. But there were so really, many cool ideas like really all bizarre. baked in one. This was back in the days when, when GM was producing things like the Aztec and whatnot as well. So a lot of interesting ideas trying to make one truck or vehicle be everything to everybody. Uh, I think that the Avalanche was a better executed vehicle, especially the second generation. So, yeah, not not um, not GM's uh, brightest moment. We actually have other GM vehicles on this list as well. So let's move on to the next um, not so great idea, but kind of cool and funky, and that's uh, number s uh, five. No, <laughs> sorry, number five, which is the Dodge Dakota convertible. Whoa, dude. Yep. Whoa. Now, there are a couple different vari uh, variations of this vehicle, um, and it, it, wasn't, it didn't last very long for, for several reasons, but what you basically have here, this is, a, I believe, the 1989 version. This might be the Shelby. And it also a V8. Mm -hmm. that, was, mean, that was an option. And um, these trucks were, well, frankly, <laughs> it's just not the best idea. Really of, bizarre. Yeah. I mean, let's say you want a Jeep, but you really want a real pickup truck, and you only need to hold two people, then... Um, and, and you want a soft top that you can quickly lower or raise, it, 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 which it, it probably wasn't was, quickly. <laughs> it took forever. Which was noisy and oh, le um, may yeah. have leaked a little bit. And yeah. It was really strange. But the, here's the thing. Dakota is no longer on sale. No. You know, Ram and Dodge completely discontinued it. Yep. And a lot of people still love the old Dakota pickup trucks. Oh, yeah. I, I love both generations. The Well, the first two generations. The, the last one that they built, not so much. But... The, the bottom line is that this truck didn't really do anything that was unique and special other than have a convertible top. The Shelby version of this was considered pretty fast at the time. And what they were doing is exactly what they're doing today with certain Jeep products. They're extending it by finding new ways to bring people into the showrooms, and this was one of them. And although it wasn't a popular seller, it still did sell. I have seen a couple on the street over the past, say, 10 years. So yeah, <laughs> it's, it's really rare. It's and, rare and, and bizarre. I think the value of this truck now is going up because how rare it is, and if you find one in good shape, you, I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, good luck on uh, doing but that. But the value of these trucks is pretty high because how rare they are. Yeah, it is a factory vehicle. It's not like somebody took a blowtorch and took it down. All right, let's get to the next one. Number and four. The, this is one of the most. Uh, this is one of the least successful vehicles Ford has ever produced. This is the Lincoln Blackwood. And I actually yes. remember a commercial showing Mark McGuire <laughs> taking the keys to, like, the very first one. And supposedly he took it down the street and parked it in a parking lot and walked away. I I'm not kidding. That's, that's the rumor. That truck is probably worth millions. It right? could, well, it could be. You know, I mean, it uses some steroids in the glove compartment or whatnot or some other enhancements. Um, the point is, is that this truck had a couple quirks about it. Now, yes, it's basically a Ford F-150. Um, with, you know, the additional grills and whatnot. But look at this. This is actually how it came. That is a split tailgate that opens outward yes. barn door style. Do you know what's inside that tailgate? 
A carpeted bed. Fully carpeted bed. Not only on the floor, but on but, the sides. But it's perfect for baseball bats. You could put a lot you of could, baseball a bats A couple in there. golf clubs could go yes. in there as well, you know, golf bags. Uh, this overall design and everything else that went about this vehicle was, frankly, considered polarizing to a lot of people. And the bottom line was, it seriously was nearly double the price of the equivalent F-150. Uh, they were going for well over $50,000. It's another vehicle that I did have a chance to sample, and I was stunned. Uh, I mean, the interior is as nice as any Lincoln's interior, but at the time, you could buy a Ford F-150 with a really high-end interior for a hell of a lot less. That and the fact that the tail was completely, I mean, everything in the bed, pretty much from the cab back was useless. I mean, you really couldn't use it. Well, you couldn't put your gardening equipment nope, in there at all. But it could tow, right? Yes, but only two-wheel drive. They never made an all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive version of it. Oh, boy. So, yeah, they really kind of kicked themselves in the, uh, yeah. And because of that, these vehicles, some of the, le uh, the, the lowest sales numbers that Ford's ever had, right here. That's what you're looking at. So total bummer on that, and um, they kind did... Of like, can I say something yeah, I yeah. like about this? Sure. I like the kind of the uh, aquatic m motif or theme. It almost looks like, you know, it could be parked uh, near a yacht somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, for a very well, you know, well-to-do uh, gentleman or lady who drives their pickup truck and just going golfing, you know, once in a while. <coughs> Yeah, for the boat guy, I guess that, that might be compelling. I'm uh, a they, captain, by the way. You are a captain, <laughs> uh, Capitan. And they did come out with a replacement to this that did sell for a little while that was basically a less polarizing version of it without the really expensive bed. By the way, the bed, that whole back se section was built by Magna Steyr, and they uh, shorted Ford, and there was a major issue. It was a big lawsuit, everything else. Just a bad luck truck, really. Let's move on to the next one. Number uh, three on our list. Number three on our list. Ta da! Now, we have actually had quite a bit of experience with this truck. Um, we Jeep. have a lot of videos on our channel. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes. Most, uh, both on car and truck, we have the, um, the FC. There's some concept ones that we've uh, driven. And recently, Roman, not this year, but last year's Moab Jeep Safari, he actually drove one of these that belonged to Mark Allen, the head of Jeep Design. And it looked like that vehicle, but it actually was very different. It was built on a uh, uh, Wrangler platform. But the point is, is that those trucks, they were incredible. There we go, right over there. Um, those trucks had interesting engines. There was a diesel version that was a two-stroke that was supercharged. It was built for the Navy. It um, had, obviously, a you know, four-wheel drive, power takeoff. And what you're looking at is, even though it's FC's forward control, basically because it has a cab over design, but they had bus versions of it. They had uh, wagon versions. Cool one. Yeah, that's that was a, I drove that, that one. That was a little bit uh, older, 2012. That those are concepts, and I drove. Well, these are the same concept. I actually got a chance to drive those in Moab. Oh, yeah, five years. Wow, it's been a long time. And it's terrifying to drive because you're sitting over the front wheels. These are even more exaggerated than this one. And they were a lot bigger. This is built on a, um, the uh, JK platform. JK, oh, yeah, JK yeah, but, platform. but the driving sensation is really interesting because you're sitting on basically on top of the front axle. Yeah, you're, you're actually it's, slightly ahead of it. It's a cab over yeah. design, basically. And, and what they did, actually, is they eventually cut this top off and, and made it actually convertible, similar to the uh, Dodge Dakota we were just talking about. But uh, yeah, check them out. There's a lot of fun to drive those vehicles, and we do have video of us driving them. Uh, Roman once again drove this one. I drove this one. Okay, let's move on to uh, number two. Number two. Now, number two actually has two different vehicles involved. Ta da! Now, despite so civilized? everything. Civilized? <laughs> civilized? Not really. They, these things were raucous. Um, I love the Subaru Brat. Um, I tried to buy one, and my, when my father found out, he did horrible things. Um, this is a vehicle that actually was brought to the United States and they put those rear seats in there so they could avoid the chicken tax because it was technically considered a four passenger car. And as such, a lot of people would yank those seats out. It was all basically one unit, pull them out and you could, you know, hold items in there. I don't think it could really hold a lot. I don't think it could tow a lot. But I saw people abusing the hell out of those things with doubling and tripling the capacity. Or the There's still a lot of these around Boulder, Colorado. Oh, hell yeah. They're really popular. Colorado is a big place for Subarus oh, in yeah. general. 
and brats are still around. There's some in perfect condition, and some are some <laughs> are less than perfect, <laughs> I, I, and some are modified with giant tires. I've seen those. Lifted. Yeah, they've done so many things to them. Now, the first generation, which you're looking at here, had the round headlights. Second generation had the square headlights and had a slightly different body. Um, but these seats remain the same. Now, I have sat in the back of these things, actually in a place called Gorman, California. And you sit in the back of these, and there's actually an oh crap handlebar that you could hold. I kid you not, yes, it's a grip. Yes. And you could hold it. And you know what? You kind of needed to. The belt barely fit, the, the seat belt. They did have a seat belt that was available that you could put on. And you really were taking your life in your own hands if you uh, rode in the back of these. But I, actually, I took one of these, the second generation off-road in Gorman, California. <laughs> it was great. It's just, it's so lightweight. Uh, it didn't really need much horsepower. It didn't have much horsepower. By the way, spare tire under the hood. Yep. Yikes. That's really bizarre and unusual, right? No, actually, uh, uh, Subaru had been doing that for years. And there's a second part of this number two. Yep. Which is this. Wham-o! And Subaru you, Baja. And you chose the brightest, ugliest version of it. Yes. This is the um, first generation of that. There was technically just one generation. The Baja had uh, a three-year uh, shelf life where the Brat was built from 78 to 94, but it was sold in America in a slightly different dates. But the, uh, the Baja, that was actually a fairly popular vehicle. In fact, we just talked to somebody who we worked with in the past, and his wife has one. A turbo with a manual. Yes, you could they, get a turbo they, with yes. a manual. Basically, you're getting like a WRX early version with uh, a pickup truck bed, kind of, sort of. And there are a couple of interesting things about this, and I'll tell you real quick, and I got this directly from people who are in the industry new. Uh, first of all, there is a turbo version. We already mentioned that. Um, and they had a small mid-gate that folded. Not the whole thing, but just part of it. Stayed, right? The glass stayed, right? Back seats only had provisions for two seat belts. And the reason why, supposedly, is General Motors, who was partnered with Subaru at the time, did not want a vehicle that competed with the Avalanche. Avalanche had three seat belts in the back, and it was a much bigger vehicle. I don't see the logic in this. This is, uh, this is 1990s logic or okay. whatnot, uh, early but, 2000s logic. But and it's basically, you know, looks like an Outback, mm -hmm. a, a Subaru. If you saw it from the front, you would think it's an Outback. Except but, for the two-tone dis destruction well, here. Yeah, but, but <laughs> then when you looked at the back, you're like, wait, wait a minute. Yep. yep but actually, a... people, there's uh, an option. Some people put a shell on the back. Yeah, there's actually a company that built a shell for the and back. And you could sleep. You know, you can lower the mid-gate. You know, the glass would yeah. stay. But you could put your feet under it yeah. and actually sleep there. Yeah, there was enough length. The, the length, once you put the tailgate down and lowered the mid-gate, you could get surfboards in there, no problem. Um, but once again, the rear seat's only to seat belts, and the center part is this large plastic component that you could open up and store things in. So, actually, I looked at one of these back when I found out I was going to become a father, and I thought, uh, okay, I might want to consider, I would just moved to Colorado, maybe I should buy something like this. My wife kind of wanted something like that, all-wheel drive. Well, I didn't do it because of the back seat could only hold two as opposed to three. But these things are really popular. They hold their value quite well. And personally speaking, if you get the later editions of them, which was all one color, primarily they only had a few colors. Um, the all blue one, you'd see a slit on the hood. I mean, it was a turbo. And they were quick and they were fun and they do great in the snow. And they're pretty utilitarian. I actually am kind of bummed that they don't have anything like this today other than, say, the Ridgeline, which is a whole different league. All right, let's move on. Um, we're going one. to number one. And Andre, this is one of your favorites. Uh, yeah, well, I have a mixed uh, th thoughts on this. You know, part of me really loves this. Uh, this is the Chevy SSR. It was built between 03 and 06, and it came actually with a really beefy 6-liter V8 engine. Yep. Up to 400 horsepower at one point. And that's great power. I love the looks of this. It has a retro style. Oh, yeah. Right? But it had a lot of issues as well. Yeah. First of all, it was expensive. Oh, yeah. Second of all, it had a hard re top retractable roof. That, that folded and went between yes. where you were sitting. Basically, there's a bulkhead here. And then, the, the, um, then there's, well, you have a bed. It and basically <laughs> folded, rolled, and folded down in, in that space. And it didn't work very and well. And it had a small bed. Well, once again, not very useful bed. Wooden slats in the bed, though, looked really cool. Yeah, so it, it had this, like, kind of a hot rod, kind of a retro feeling to it. It sounded great, had a big V8 engine, but 
the frame of this vehicle was a little bit not so stiff. Yeah. So it tended to twist a bit when when you apply all this power, 400 horsepower to the rear wheels. They didn't handle very well. Uh, in a straight line, they were fairly quick. They did have a manual option with the larger engine option near the end of its life cycle. And, you know, this is a vehicle that kind of came out around the same time as the Plymouth Prowler, which yes. was another vehicle that looked like a concept and, and kind of goofy and fun. And it's another one where they didn't quite cross the finish line, you know? Right, because it had a V6. Yeah, and an automatic transmission, right. and it was painfully but slow. But anyway, I, had kind of, I have kind of mixed feelings. I kind of want to buy one of these as a project, and I looked it up, and they range between... Well, right now on Craigslist or eBay, between eighteen and twenty-two thousand, mm -hmm. depending on the condition and mileage. But this could be kind of an interesting project, but it could be also a nightmare. Oh, I I, I would totally walk away from it. But but you you have different tastes than I. Um, so, so I wanted to look at a few comments before we move on. Yeah, we have some bonuses, but we'll get to that in a second. Let's talk. Let's talk to you guys. Well, one of you asked early on. Is there a way to get a signed copy of our Truck Nuts book? Ooh, good and question. That's a very good question. Um, let's, uh, let's talk offline. Um, you know, you could, of course, send us a book and we'll send you a uh, signed copy. Or we can work something else out, potentially, you know, us sending you a copy that's signed, but we have to handle payment. It's kind of a messy thing. Now, Mr. Truck just uses a large red X, right, when he signs things? <laughs> so I just I wanted to make sure about well, that. Well, yes. Uh, it's a joke, of course, but <laughs> but yes, thank you for mentioning the book. You know, we're very proud of it. We just updated. We had a, a few editing problems in the book initially, but the new version is on sale right now. You can go to trucknutsbook.com, and this is a pickup truck guide. Yep. You know, we have our eye gauntlet testing in there, MPG testing, uh, some stories from Mr. Truck. Yes. And he has lots of stories. You wrote a chapter on yeah. your experience in a pickup truck. That's correct. Roman uh, threw in a, one as well. So you're really getting a, a nice chunk of what we do and what we know. And these guys worked really hard on it. Uh, it's quite a project. So let's... Uh, oh, and one other thing, by the way. Uh, we're actually going to be doing another... Uh, a different version of our MPG loop. So stay tuned for that. That will be coming down TFL truck down the line. Yes, we want to do a combined MPG loop, not just a highway loop. But we always try to give a, away a hat during our live show. Yep. And this, uh, this but, but time... But explain what, who gets it. Yes. Um, so we have a Patreon page, which is a way for you guys, another way for you guys to support us, patreon.com slash TFLcar. And right now, YouTube revenue is really spotty. Yeah. There are some issues with advertisers, and obviously, that's our main bread and butter. So it is. All the help you can provide is very, very appreciated. And we want to give back. Yep. So for those of you guys who give $10 a month, we pick a person at random yep. every morning when we do this Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m. And we give away a hat. This time it's a Mazda hat. Yeah, it's a nice one too. Uh, which we get at events that we go at. And uh, I randomly picked Jonathan Gerard. And I think I'm selling your, uh, uh, saying your last name correctly. I'll email you, and if you like a Mazda hat, we'll send you one. All right. All right, let's get to a couple more questions here before we get to our final uh, part, which is the bonuses. I'm sure some of you are going to be able to guess. Well, what our a lot of are. Uh, comments are here. Uh, somebody mentioned F 150 Lightning, but that's kind of a different genre of pickup truck. That's a that's sport a, truck? High performance. Yeah, and, and that would go along with like the Chevy 454 SS and you know, the um, SRT uh, Ram. Those are fast trucks, and I think we will eventually put together a list on those. But, uh, and it is unusual, but at the same time, muscle trucks, I think we'll save that for a whole different uh, video. Uh, what else have we got, uh, Andre? Well, some people are mentioning uh, kind of a customized pickup trucks. Uh, things like uh, some shops did kind of a one-off on. Yeah. Like there was a Volvo pickup truck somebody did. There was a BMW M3. There was a Nissan truck. Leaf pickup truck, which Nissan actually was Leaf. done at Nissan, but it's not a production vehicle. So, um, yes, those are, uh, once again, a customized truck, but we wanted to focus on bizarre trucks that had a kind of a production run. Right. And were manufacturer, at least either made or authorized. Yes, yes. So, out of all these vehicles, I think, let's see, I've driven the SSR, I've driven both the Bat, Brat and the Baja, so. I've probably driven about 80% of these vehicles, and I can tell you, they are bizarre for one reason or another. 
Um, what about Ford Explorer Sport Track? You know, that's a really good one. And that actually had two generations. Um, it, um, it was sort of a stopgap measure. Ford was going to get rid of the uh, Ranger, which ironically kept being built while this was being built, so it, they kind of competed for sales. But Ford didn't have a Ranger that had a full quad cap. Uh, they had a king cap version, or they had another term for it. But um, because of that, they, they built this thing. And it was an Explorer. It wasn't just a, a stretched Ford Ranger. And they sold enough to where they felt like they could build the second generation. Um, that probably should have been our bonus because it was a really unusual truck. One of the guys in my neighborhood has one. Uh -huh. And actually, it's really cool. I mean, it's frame-based. So right. you could tow up to about 5,000 pounds with a Sport Track Explorer. And I kind of like it. They also had an adrenaline version. Yeah. Remember those with yeah. really fan, like funky paint, like sport paint, yep. like either white or red. Some pla extra with cladding. That... Cladding and like pinstriping. Yeah. Uh, so that, that was really interesting. Somebody is yeah. saying, uh, how about an UAS pickup truck from Russia? Now that, well. <laughs> speaking your language, my friend. Yes, um, probably not too many of those in the United States. Uh, no. But we're basically talking about North America. But our bonus is, is right here. There we go. So there was a whole genre of, of pickup trucks which were car-based. Oh, yeah. And that, you're looking at the Ranchero, uh, which is based on the Falcon. My old man actually had one of these, and uh, as a kid, I helped him fix it up. It looked beautiful, and then we detonated the engine. Um, but look at the style. You know, it had really cool style. You know, body line, the, the fenders, the way everything looked. And all kinds of cars were, including a Chevy El Camino. Mm -hmm. um, they had a lot of different versions of Oh, these. yeah, yeah. These things started all the way back, at least in the, in the U.S., in the 50s. And they kind of kept the idea going all the way into the 70s. And I believe the early 80s is when they finally went away. Um, there are some people who want them back. Uh, to a lesser degree, I guess you could say that the uh, Honda Ridgeline is sort of the spiritual uh, successor to those things because it's based on a car. Well, minivan. Crossover. Okay. Crossover, yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, I don't think these things are going to make much of a comeback. There used to be uh, rumors about uh, Chevrolet bringing in based on a Holden platform, which they yeah. have. Australians, Australians yeah. They and have the Australians of love their utes. Um, but most Americans seem to want pickup trucks as opposed to car-based vehicles. So F-150s over those cars for sure. But yeah, these, these are, um, I remember in, uh, being a kid in, in high school and a lot of guys would get these and beef them up and they'd come with massive engines, but there would be no weight in the rear end. And I used, I used to call them widow makers because <laughs> you would lose traction and you're, you're basically going to go off into a ditch and die. Even if you're nowhere near a ditch, it'll find a ditch and it will kill you. They were really, really dangerous. So some guys, to make them fast and to make them somewhat safer, would put sandbags in the back of them, which worked when you were going straight. Then you slam on your brakes, and sometimes the, slam, uh, the <laughs> sandbags would slam into the back of the bulkhead, and all of a sudden you had even more weight in front of the rear axle, and it wasn't good. So, yeah, they, they had issues. So just a, a couple, couple more, more questions? questions before we close out. We like to these shows to go about 30 minutes, yeah. and we're a little bit over time, but... Uh, of course, some of you mentioned the G8 ST, which was basically an Australian youth version. Yeah, once which again. Was awesome. And actually, a guy in Colorado uh, imports them and, and mm -hmm. modifies them. That's right. So you can actually get a few of these in the United States. That's right. But it's not exactly something that's easy to come by. And I'm sure someone here would probably mention the Brute, which was a Jeep Wrangler, the modern one, that had a uh, basically a tailgate and a bed grafted onto the back of it, and they made them longer. Uh, that uh, is kind of sort of what we're expecting with the next Jeep Wrangler pickup truck in the future, and of course we'll mention that once we get more information on it. Um, Anything there's else? Also, there's also a question about hybrid trucks, and I guess we can close on this question. Okay. Um, I also wanted to bring up this one particular Chevy Silverado 1500 High Desert, which actually has in the top of the beds little storage compartments, similar to what Ram has. Right, the Ram box. Um, but um, let me see. Um, the reason why I'm p pulling up a Chevrolet is because Chevrolet does a light duty hybrid yeah. truck, but very mild hybrid, which means- Chevy and GMC. Yeah, Chevy and GMC, uh, which means you cannot run it on electricity alone. The electric motor is there to just to help out. And this truck right here, I don't know, Ian, if you can get this. Um, this is the new concept from 
Chevrolet, and you see a flying buttress here. That's very reminiscent. So of reminiscent the, uh, of the avalanche. Avalanche, yeah. And the storage boxes on the side, uh, but. Actually, this week, there's an electric pickup that was unveiled, the Workhorse mm -hmm. W15. So, electrification and pickup trucks are beginning to sort of advance. There's another company that actually takes uh, Chevy pickup trucks and makes them all electric yes. as well. But that's not VM quite the motors. same. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but that's not the, the same thing. Uh, so, yeah, there is electric... Uh, electric uh, Electrification? Thank you. I, it's all morning with this. So, uh, with that and the fact that we've run just a little bit over, guys, if you have more questions, give us a few minutes after we shut down, and then this video will actually become a real video on YouTube, and then we'll look at it again in, say, an hour or two and uh, answer a few more questions if you have them. Yes. All right? And come back. We're doing these live shows Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, so we appreciate your comments and a lot of engagement in the chat room, which we yeah. love to see. So. We really appreciate that, and of course, you know, we appreciate you watching because that's how we are able to do these videos. Yep, the live channel is growing quite a bit, TFL Now is definitely starting to grow, so keep it up, guys. We appreciate it. For the Fastlane Truck, Nathan and Andre, we'll see you next time. Thanks.